we have a very exciting agenda ahead of us, um, which um, will kick off with a keynote uh, addressed by the World Bank Group. Um, with some insights on how multinational enterprises have been responding and reacting in the context of COVID-19, based on a survey that's truly hot off the press um, that was conducted in 2021, so this year, uh, between uh, February and March. Uh, and then we have an opportunity for a very uh, brief uh, Q&A uh, following the first speaker before we go into a panel of various speakers where we get uh, some very... Um, very uh, uh, dis different insights uh, from around the world, from Bangladesh, Moldova, Tunisia, and Colombia, um, with thanks to our distinguished speakers from JICA, UNIDO, and GIZ. So um, just a, a few housekeeping notes. Um, before the Q&A session, um, please use the Q&A section in the, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and then we can, uh, uh, we can I, I will repeat them to the speakers. Uh, and feel, 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 feel free also to uh, type in your questions directly uh, throughout the presentations. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the floor Ivan Antonimac from uh, the World Bank Group with the first uh, keynote address. Thank you very much. Welcome, Ivan. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. And uh, good afternoon to everybody, or good morning if... Uh, if like in Washington, it's, uh, it's in the morning. Um, yeah, so, so my presentation uh, will, be, will be quite brief, to looking at three aspects. Uh, what multinationals are saying uh, in response to a pulse survey that we've been uh, doing in the bank. So this is, we've done, a, we've done four now, asking multinationals uh, during the time of COVID, how they're responding and what the impact is. I'll be looking at um, uh, three trends that emerge. Um, there are many trends, but three sort of key trends that we're seeing. And then talking a little bit about uh, good policy uh, responses. Next slide, please. So it probably doesn't need to be said, but just by way of introduction, obviously COVID caused both supply and demand shocks. On the supply side, it was about um, a lot about the inputs that would go into production, shortage of, uh, you know, people were not able to, to go to workplaces, but also the other inputs that go into the productive process were, uh, were stymied. And then there was also the demand side of it. So obviously decrease in, in consumption, decrease from upstream firms where value is added. Uh, but there are also some parts of the economy which were less affected. Um, but uh, all in all, it was both a demand and a supply shock uh, in total. Next slide, please. And again. Great. So there are um, good reasons why FDI should be a part of the discussed as a part of the recovery, the post-pandemic recovery. And, and, and the first one is, of course, that FDI brings, brings benefits to the host economy, such as the ones that are, that are up there, jobs, innovation, access to new markets, and of course, uh, technology, among others. Uh, but the difficulty has been, as I've just pointed out, that you know, there's been this impact on FDI, which has been measured as something around 40%, a 40% reduction of global FDI flows and also an accompanying, accompanying uh, disruption of uh, supply chains, uh, which, are, which are vital to production in, in a globalized world. And so um, the question becomes, uh, you know, how should governments react in these circumstances or how have they reacted since we're now 12 months on? Because FDI is such a key uh, source of development finance uh, and will continue to be uh, obviously in the post-COVID world. Um, and the reality is that in order to achieve this, uh, the sustainable development goals, there needs to be more financing, not less financing. So where will this financing come from? In part, we hope it would come from recovering FTI. Um, one more click, please. Um, and, and this is the framework that we use when we're um, advising, providing advisory to governments on FDI. 
Uh, these are the sort of places around what we call the investment life cycle where governments can provide support. And I won't read them. You can see them hopefully big enough on your screen, but essentially it's attraction, investment entry, retention and protection and linkages with local firms, which is uh, the reason why countries seek to attract FDI, that is to get the benefits that flow through uh, the interaction between the domestic economy and the incoming firms. And the types of interventions that we're talking about around attraction are typically with IPAs uh, on in, or also on incentives in entry on dealing with barriers to entry in protection and retention. It is about uh, the operations of the, um, of the foreign business within the economy and so on and so forth. So this is just kind of the framework that we use uh, when uh, supporting governments in their FDI policy. Next slide, please. To introduce this, uh, this survey that I mentioned at the very beginning, so it was, it's a survey that we've been, this is, we've had four of them, at the, it's, it's four surveys every quarter since the start of COVID, 329 affiliates of multinational corporations in 37 developing countries in each of the world regions with a spread between um, manufacturing and services sectors. And I've provided um, at the bottom, the details of where you can go uh, online to see um, the survey dashboard, which provides the output data from the survey and the survey report itself. Next slide, please. So just a few headline items. The first one is that the COVID impacts, when I mentioned the 40% reduction of flows, that these impacts are reducing in intensity and there's an improving outlook for investor confidence. So looking back over the course of you know, 2020, uh, in totality, this, the large majority of multinational corporations, 86%, said that their operations and financial performance were less disrupted over the second half of the year, pointing to a, a gradual improvement. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, there's been a notable uptake of new technologies um, and also a um, move towards sustainability that we've seen across these responses. Um, so it's not all about the disruptions, it's also about the adjustment of the private sector and multinationals in, the, in these circumstances. And I'll go a little bit more into these two, two trends of uh, technology adoption and environmental sustainability in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, the implication at the beginning or the sort of general understanding was that there would be massive um, effects on supply chains in the long run and that uh, companies would be, you know, shifting the form and shape of their value chains accordingly. Um, what actually we're seeing is a gradual uh, improvement and, and the situation that the majority, something like here we say 75%, as a result of the survey responses uh, of uh, multinational affiliates plan to keep their investment level unchanged. That is their sort of reinvestment within the country where they are is, is largely unchanged. unchanged. And uh, previous um, uh, I, or notions or uh, beliefs that uh, supply chains would, would be um, tilt in what was called the direction of resilience as, a, as, as opposed to the direction of uh, efficiency, that is that there would be nearshoring, reshoring, et cetera, um, so far is not, you know, is not as big, nowhere near as big as was originally envisaged. So there is some, um, uh, res, you know, the, the resilience part is, is let's say, um, um, trumping for want of a better word, the, the, the move towards, the perceived move towards um, uh, uh, um, uh, nearshoring and reshoring. So the disruption in, in short of supply chains is not what was originally uh, conceived. Um, next, next slide, please. And finally, uh, in terms of the big, big messages coming out of the survey is that government policy remains very important uh, in investment climate more broadly and in the retention and expansion of FDI. And 91% of the 
responding companies said that the regulations or policies helped their parent companies decide, you know, to increase investment to stay in the country and so forth. Um, so, so that's uh, that's the, the the fourth key message. Next slide, please. Great. So, um, in terms of the the acceleration of the digital economy, first of all, it's important to note that there was a move towards the digital economy in any event prior to COVID, and all of these, um, this one and the next uh, trend, which I'll talk about was simply accelerated by COVID. It's not as if this is something new. So first of all, um, the, the, the size of the digital economy in terms of its contribution to, to, to GDP is growing very rapidly. It's growing at two and a half times the pace of the rest of the world economy. And it's, a, a, it's believed that it will be about 25% of global GDP within a decade. Um, that has implications. It has implications in particular for the locational determinants of FDI. That is why, you know, which, what are the motivating factors for FDI? And it's going to be, uh, it means less focus on low cost, more focus on skills. Um, it means a change in the comparative advantage of developing countries, um, but it also, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a lower transaction cost, less uh, costs of trade and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, there could be challenges that arise as a result of, uh, you know, there could be leapfrogging, but there's also an investment that needs to be put in place in terms of um, digital infrastructure that just may not be there or could take a long time to put in place. Another click, please. Now, as I said, the pandemic accelerated um, the digitization. Some numbers there on the number of firms reporting to have deployed digital tools in two respects. One in business, um, business to consumer tools and the other one in terms of its own internal management. So support the staff working remotely and also management of its supply chains. Um, and so on that point, so 33% reported that they were mapping the tiers of their supply chains to see potential vulnerabilities using digital, you know, di di digital platforms and so forth. So as you can see that the, the, the notion of digital, it's, um, it's coming in in various ways. It's coming in as you know, digitally, uh, you know, the digital infrastructure that countries uh, are needing to have, the way in which companies are interacting with their consumers, but the way in which companies are also operating internally. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, and one more click. Great. So uh, the other mega trend, if you, if, if you will, is uh, environmental sustainability and green growth. Uh, on the left side column, I just wanted to point out that in international agreements, international investment agreements and trade agreements and so forth, we've seen a proliferation in the last few years of new uh, clauses related to sustainable development, green investment, support to SDGs, support to the state's right to regulate. This is um, a trend that's been happening in any event and in the latest um, investment agreements and trade agreements such as um, uh, the CAI agreement between China and the European uh, Union or RCEP, which is a big Asian agreement, we see this trend continuing. Um, um, but at the same time on the right, right side column, um, the pandemic has also put an increasing focus uh, or a further focus on a green recovery. You see this talked about a lot by governments. Uh, and so what we found, for, found from the survey was that two thirds of our multinationals were reported taking steps to increase sustainability and decarbonize their products and in particular amongst manufacturing firms. Next slide, please. So it's not all um, kind of uh, positive trends or trends that might advance development. There's also some trends of, in, uh, a trend of increasing protectionism. So what we've seen is 66 new measures. We started measuring from the time of the start of COVID, new measures in terms of barriers or uh, liberalization of entry of foreign direct investment into countries. We found that 70% of new measures since COVID were restricting entry. So countries are taking steps 
and I would say, I would say the survey tells us, um, and the information tells us that we're gathering from these, um, uh, that we're gathering from uh, policy steps by government is that 70% come from you know, developed countries or, or, or more, 80% from OECD countries and 70% of them are restricting entry. The small number of facilitating entry uh, sort of steps are mostly in Asia and the Middle East. I'll give a couple of examples there on the slide. So by restrictive measures, I mean increasing screening, um, increasing the concept of what's, uh, what's national security sector, so that investments in a particular sector in a very broad sense are deemed national security uh, are screened or simply not allowed. Uh, so this is um, a trend that we hope will be reversed with the end of COVID, although we're seeing that a lot of these policy measures that are being put in place, and sometimes they're through legislation, uh, don't have any uh, grandfathering clause. There's nothing apparent in them that suggests they're going to be removed. Um, some of them do, uh, but, but many do not. Next slide, please. So this is basically the final, final slide. Um, government's responses show there should be an, uh, an apostrophe after the SM governments. Um, what we've been uh, advising in light of all of this, right? So what we've been advising, there, was, there were two elements of the response, the crisis response and then the post outbreak recovery. We're now into the, the second column, but in the first column, it was obviously the urgent measures around fiscal and financial support and so forth. And, and a big focus around retention. So retaining existing investors, uh, uh, doing aftercare with the existing investors, making sure that whatever difficulties they were facing as a consequence of the pandemic was being addressed proactively by the government. So big focus, uh, less focus on trying to attract new investment because it does, doesn't make sense in these circumstances, more focus on retaining and advocating for reforms and keeping the existing investors. Uh, and as I said, some country go governments in increase the barriers, and we also were providing advice around how to make these as less and in least intrusive as possible, you know, through grandfathering clauses and other measures. So the the four step process that we hope and we are advising governments uh, around in, in post COVID, and we're doing quite a bit of work around this in in um, probably about. Yeah, well, an increasing number of interventions, I'll put it that way, is to do these four steps, refor review, confirm, reform, and promote. So typically, uh, governments will promote uh, into a, prom seek to promote FDI into a given number of sectors where they have a good value proposition for foreign investors. Um, so we are, are advising, given the COVID situation, to review those sectors in which they are seeking to address or had been in the past seeking to address FDI for a risk assessment and benchmarking and figuring out exactly, do they remain competitive? Are those sectors still viable and attracting FDI? Uh, that would lead to um, a, a re-evaluation of the, of the FDI or the IP, you know, investment policy and promotion or the FDI strategy in place by the government. Um, it should also, as a part of this process, test, test which previous target sectors have proven resilient, as I was talking about earlier, and identify any emerging competitive sectors or segments uh, that they may have an opportunity to attract FDI in as a result of this um, a little smaller amount of remapping and reassuring uh, than we originally thought, but nevertheless, these disruptions have caused opportunities for some, and I can explain that perhaps later in the discussion. So that's the reviewing and confirming the sectors, and then also reforming, looking at those new, newly emerged sectors and seeing what barriers exist in terms of those within um, the legal and regulatory framework and making sure that those are reduced. Also trying to increase the resilience of the domestic firms that they hope, that governments hope will link to the incoming foreign firms, and finally, to move towards promotion at some point in the future. Some countries are already doing that now, promoting those new sectors and developing a new outreach program to reposition the country. So that's kind of the post outbreak um, recovery work. We also find, and this is my last point, that, that there is a, a lot of work, as I mentioned earlier, around retention. So we are working with, um, 
with several countries on putting in place retention programs, that is um, programs that are outreach in nature that try to address operational risks and also to an extent political risks faced by firms in countries so that they can we can capture any grievances and any issues that arise before they might es escalate and lead to divestment. So um, I'll stop there and um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ivan. I don't see any questions yet in the chat. Um, I also want to uh, let everybody know you can also raise your hand uh, with the Zoom feature and then we can unmute you if you would prefer to pose your question directly. And the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared. Uh, to kick off the Q&A, maybe um, some of our attendees will be encouraged. Um, Ivan, I'll, uh, I'll ask a few questions. Um, fascinating presentation, thank you so much. Uh, with some encouraging news, it's good to know that 90% of firms said that government regulations actually do make a difference. So government can do something to influence uh, investment facilitation. And also that three quarters uh, indicated that uh, they do not plan to fundamentally restructure or uh, change their investment levels. Um, would you, could you speak a little about which sectors were particularly impacted uh, during the COVID period and how, if you can, if you have the information, how they potentially adjusted uh, uh, to the new challenges, but maybe also new opportunities? Thanks. I'm just unmuting myself. Good. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, I, you know, part of the very early work that we did was to try to um, to try to figure that precisely that the answer to that question. Um, what we found that um, first of all, the resilient sectors, the ones that developing countries, um, will continue maintain to be resilient um, for developing countries. I guess it's no surprise medical supply manufacturing but also information technology, any IT enabled services, um, business processing, outsourcing, financial services, food processing, horticulture were the sort of the ones that remained, um, you know, that, that remained uh, resilient sectors. Um, the ones that uh, were very negatively affected um, were, were the ones that were around, let's say, the consumption, like human-based consumption, if you wish, you know, consumption. So tourism, um, but also ones that were reliant on um, efficiency of supply. So auto automotive component manufacturing, electronics component manufacturing, that sort of, that sort of uh, area was the most disrupted. And of course, face-to-face -face retail was the most disrupted. But then I think um, we've seen that we, the, the quick adaptation with digitization, especially with retail, uh, also with um, the, the return of trade. So, you know, I think trade uh, is not being as disrupted as FDI. In fact, trade levels are the same, if not higher um, than they were pre-COVID. So I think in terms of goods production, so things like just-in-time auto manufacturing and the, some of those things that were initially disrupted are much less disrupted now. And now the disruption is still, you know, impacting things like tourism more so. Um, and obviously, I should mention the other opportunity sectors like logistics, uh, online entertainment, these kinds of things just, just grew exponentially. So. Um, I think the good news that we can say is, first of all, the indicator that trade didn't, you know, the trade has recovered. It's great for goods. I think services, because they're much more person to person and individuals going from one country to the next in some cases, those that are reliant on that sort of individual presence within a country uh, continue to be affected. Those that are digital based that can be done just like our work can be done this way, uh, much less affected or not affected. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we will have another opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so I will, uh, I think this is actually a good segue to move on to our country case studies, um, because we will delve into some of the responses by governments as well as some of the impacts on specific sectors. 
So I would now like to welcome to the floor Ms. Itosaki uh, from JICA to, to talk to us about the experience of Bangladesh and how uh, the country and the government has been responding in the context of COVID. Over to you. Right. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Saki Ito from uh, Private Sector Development Group of JICA. Um, I'm going to present the case study of Bangladesh um, where we are um, doing a project. Thank you. Um, outline of today's very short presentation is quick introduction of our project in Bangladesh and then the uh, impact of COVID in Bangladesh and the immediate reactions uh, by the authority and I'll uh, share with you uh, a couple of activities on COVID and investment promotion. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, the outline of our project is called the Project for Promoting Investments in Enhancing Industrial Competitiveness in Bangladesh. Um, it's five year, um, It's a five-year technical cooperation project running from 2017 to 2022, so it's actually nearing the end, uh, consisting of three components. Uh, component one is for uh, investment uh, improvement of business environments and investment promotion. This one is with uh, Bangladesh Investment Development Authority. Uh, component two is for um, economic zones management and uh, operation, including the establishment of uh, one-stop service um, with uh, Bangladesh Economic Zones Authority. Um, component three is for invest industrial development, uh, uh, working with the uh, Ministry of Industries. So um, through these activities, is we aim to sort of increase the uh, foreign di direct investment and also uh, strengthen the capacities of local companies and create a linkage between the two. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, looking at the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on GDP growth, um, as you may already know, uh, global economic growth estimate uh, was uh, minus 3.3 in 2020. 2020, and it's estimated to be uh, plus 6.0 in 2021. Um, in Bangladesh, actually, it showed a uh, strong res resilience with 5% growth in 2020, and um, it's estimated to be around 6% growth in 2021. Next, please. Uh, this graph shows the uh, um, FDI registration and FDI inflow. Uh, well, Bangladesh marked 5% 5 per, 5 growth in 2020, but it, there was a drop in investment. Um, the blue bar shows the FDI inflow, and uh, it was gradually and steadily um, increasing until fiscal year 2018, but as you can see, uh, had a drop in 2019, and uh, it counts up to uh, June 2020, so uh, obviously it had an impact of COVID. Next, please. Uh, this is the trend of monthly uh, FDI registration. Obviously, um, well, there was a, uh, it sold in April and May 2020, uh, but it started to pick up again in October. Next, please. And the immediate actions uh, that the BIDA, the Bangladesh Investment Development Authority took, um, the BIDA took proactive initiatives to support investors um, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, in April and May, it organized a series of dialogues with several foreign embassies and chambers to hear the voices of the investors. And after the dialogues, um, BIDA proposed um, recommendations to relevant authorities to um, improve the investment um, environment. And it continued efforts to digitalize uh, licensing services. And in June, it conducted a COVID impact survey to existing investors. This one was assisted by the ISC and UK aid. Next, please. Uh, from here, I'll share our activities. Um, JICA project team is currently conducting a study to formulate a strategy uh, for investment promotion in post-COVID era. Uh, the team has actually um, categorized the business sectors into um, six uh, big groups and picked one business sector to, to analyze uh, from each group uh, according to the priority sectors of national industrial policy. 
So uh, these six are uh, RMG ready-made garments, uh, IT software, pharmaceutical, motorcycle and mo automobile, uh, electronics and food industry. Next, please. Yeah, um, this diagram shows the COVID-19 impacts and uh, the availability of institutional support in Bangladesh. So um, this diagram was uh, made by the um, survey company in Bangladesh. Um, so as you can see, uh, the impacts actually varies by sector. So strategy for um, investment promotion and how to go about it should be sought in consideration of these um, sectorial differences. Next, please. Um, yeah, actually, uh, our study is actually uh, running until uh, June. So um, what I'm sharing now is just the preliminary results. Um, so this slide and the next slide shows the uh, analysis of challenges and opportunities that, that's been observed um, in four uh, sectors out of six that we chose to, to pick up. Yeah, um, I think we don't have time to go through, so yeah. Skip next one, please. Next. Thank you. Um, so, uh, well, we uh, our team plans to um, recommend these policy measures uh, in five agendas. Uh, first, delivery of updates. Uh, um, well, sorry, delivery of updated information to investors on COVID situation and economic condition in Bangladesh. So the investors in remote. Uh, condition situations will be able to get the latest information to consider the investment. Uh, second, supporting regulatory improvement to um, ease the remaining COVID influences by, uh, re by revisiting existing investment climate issues uh, in consideration of these uh, sectorial differences. And uh, third, facilitation of reinvestment in, by existing business, because it's at a lot easier probably to reinvest than sequa, you know, greenfield new investment. And uh, fourth, targeted investment promotion for businesses with um, COVID resilience and affinity. So business sectors uh, with the characteristics of uh, digitalization, contactless, isolation, these are a lot easier to um, you know, promote and encourage to come into um, Bangladesh in the post-COVID era, so that. And uh, fifth, uh, further digitalization of uh, BDAT services and functions so that, you know, um, these barriers will not uh, hinder the, the investors to come into, uh, well, consider investing in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. And the second activity I want to share with you is a hybrid one-stop service that we're doing uh, with the uh, Economic Zones Authority. Um, we've been working with um, DESA to establish a one-stop service center since the beginning of the project. Um, it was initially um, planned to be a face-to-face in-person service, but, um, and it was actually officially launched in 19, uh, 20, 2019 and currently provides 100 and service, uh, 107 uh, government services according to the standard operating procedures that, uh, that's been developed under cross-corporate operation with design and 14 consent ministries. Obviously, we had no visitor in <laughs> April and May uh, 2020 during the lockdown, uh, but um, we are providing services, uh, well, 107 services, services including license approval issuance, certificate issuance, and recommendation letters, etc. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, um, what we did is uh, um, to to be to make available the services online as well, as well as face to face services. So all the services from pre consultation, application, assessments, up to issuance, provision of uh, certificate, and follow up consultation could be done online as well as face to face. Um, so the investors will be able to choose, you know, according to their needs in the situation, um, you know, so these are well, hybrid ones of service face to face and online. Um, so we, this is what we did to um, 
encourage investors to, to remain in Bangladesh and to attract more investment into Bangladesh. Thank you very much, that's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Saki, for this tour de force in exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> In Bangladesh, um, I might come back to you on the challenges and opportunities in this particular sector, um, because I think that's a very interesting element. Uh, some common themes are definitely uh, emerging already, and a big one is, of course, the trend towards digitalization on all dimensions, and including also service provision uh, from, from the government. So thank you very much. We'll have an opportunity to delve into more discussion uh, in a little bit. And now I would like to uh, invite uh, Ms. Nora Benamer to the, to the floor, who will uh, give us a comparative presentation of Moldova and Tunisia to very different uh, country contexts. So um, welcome, Nora. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, my name is Nora Benamer. Uh, I am a technical expert at uh, GIZ, Department of Asian Investment Partnership Project uh, in Tunisia. Uh, and today I'm going to uh, present a case study of retaining attractive and services investors uh, in context of COVID-19 in Tunisia and in Moldova. Next slide, please. Um, GIZ has been active in Moldova and in Tunisia in the area of sustainable economic development. Uh, in Tunisia, it implements the German-Tunisian Investment Partnership Program uh, with a focus on improving the investment projects processing. The project is commissioned by German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the PMZ, uh, and the political partners are Tunisia Investment Authority, the IPA, the Tunisian IPA, and the Tunisian Ministry of Economy, Finance, and Investment Support. Uh, currently, the project is having an extension beyond 2020 to uh, 2021, uh, with activities focusing on ameliorating coordination of measures to improve the investment climate, uh, strengthen the institutional and individual capacities of the TIA, as well as of other agencies, and to improve TIA's visibility. Uh, in Moldova, the economic policy applies to uh, a Moldovan government project focuses since 2015 on sustainable economic development uh, with a special focus on investment promotion. Uh, the project is commissioned by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, co-financed by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Uh, the political partners are the state chancellery and further partners include the Ministry of Economy and Infrastructure, as well as the uh, uh, The Moldovan project uh, is, uh, has a current phase from 2019 to 2022 and supported directly the creation of more than 8,000 jobs uh, with activities focusing on business environment reform combined with investment promotion, uh, dual vocational uh, education training, and ME packages. Next slide, please. In Tunisia and in Moldova, the IPAs play different roles. Uh, in Tunisia, the GIZ supports the TIA, the Tunisia Investment Authority, in its mandate to recommend business environment reforms towards the government and uh, in its role uh, to uh, be an important player uh, in institutional and public-private dialogue. Uh, as an immediate reaction to the pandemic, the Tunisian government has put in place an economic recovery plan based on the following points, strengthening national sovereignty and security, preserving the economy, reviving the sectors most affected by the pandemic, and reducing bureaucracy and digitization of the administration. On the other side, in Moldova, the IPA uh, has a very limited lobbying function. And in order to improve the business environment, GIZ has supported especially the Ministry of Economy and the State Chancellery. Uh, 
uh, at the short term, at the medium term, and at the longer term, there were uh, different measures. Uh, in, in the short term, the, the project has supported the Ministry of Economy uh, to develop econometrical tools to predict the economic consequences of COVID and uh, policy reactions. Uh, this formed the basis also for further policy developments. Uh, at the medium term, the support uh, was focusing on the development uh, and implementation of policies to support companies to weather through the pandemic. Uh, and so here, the examples include uh, subsidy schemes for SMEs and uh, integration of freelancers in the social security system. In a longer term, uh, the project uh, is uh, developing policies to grow forward better. Uh, and this is uh, in assistance to the Moldovan government, um, a dedicated COVID program and a digitalization roadmap were developed. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, in phase two, the pandemic uh, in Tunisia and in Moldova, the retention of existing investors and the attraction of new uh, investors have gained uh, importance. Uh, so in uh, Tunisia and Moldova, the existing investors uh, were uh, periodically informed uh, via webinar series uh, about the adjustment of the regulatory framework, uh, as well as incentive schemes uh, due to COVID. The pandemic uh, also enabled Moldova and Tunisia to reach out to potential new investors who would have been otherwise uh, impossible to approach. Uh, the attraction uh, of new investors uh, also uh, was a priority or is a priority. Uh, so thanks to digital information and matchmaking uh, events uh, for foreign investors, the Moldovan uh, Republic and Tunisia are gaining uh, more and more visibility, uh, as well as the uh, IPAs. Uh, uh, the participation also in digital fairs uh, is also a, a key uh, activity for the current time. Additionally, the TIA uh, has put in place uh, a digital platform to solve requests submitted by investors. Uh, the GIZ is supporting the, I the Tunisian IPA in updating communication materials, uh, value propositions and target sectors as well. Uh, the GIZ also uh, is supporting the Tunisian IPA in organizing a lead generation campaign uh, in the uh, German uh, market. Next slide. Uh, in the face of, uh, of COVID, the uh, GIZ has supported the two IPAs in Tunisia and uh, in uh, Moldova to adjust the services and the modes of uh, service delivery to investors. Uh, so in Tunisia, there was no direct support to, uh, to the investors, but the APA uh, has put a digital platform where investors can declare their investment. Uh, benefit uh, of uh, many digital services to submit requests, to request incentives, uh, to constitute uh, their companies, um, to submit a project of national uh, interest, and uh, etc. Uh, in Moldova, there were tailor-made uh, support for uh, key uh, investors in order to solve supply immediate supply chain uh, issues. Uh, there was there was also a support to five automotive uh, suppliers uh, in order to readjust their production from uh, automotive uh, covers to uh, personal uh, protective equipment. Um, so next, please. Uh, after COVID, uh, we have 
uh, learned lessons. Uh, so uh, the pandemic is still ongoing and we need to readapt and uh, change some uh, behaviors. What we have learned is that uh, important, it is important to adapt a holistic approach instead of standalone measures for investment promotion and business climate reforms. Uh, it is important to facilitate and assure a close coordination on the involved uh, of the involved stakeholders. We need to stay flexible and agile in order to adapt to unforeseen circumstances and convert challenges into opportunities. Uh, digitization is also an important aspect. So digital formats provide new opportunities for investment promotion uh, in terms of outreach uh, and exchange uh, with uh, new investors uh, or other investors in which, uh, which uh, uh, who were impossible to, to reach in normal times. It is also important to encourage exchange with other actors and capitalize on others' experience in neighbor countries. For example, GIZ and WIPA recently published a toolbox uh, on the uh, uh, promotion uh, on investment promotion agencies. You can see the link here in my presentation. It's free. Uh, it's freely available, and please uh, don't hesitate to use it. Finally, new opportunities for partner countries uh, arose uh, to participate in global value chains, uh, nearshoring, adjusted opportunities, and digitalization. So you have my contacts, uh, my, my contact and the contact of my colleagues Thomas Fersh for any further question, and don't hesitate to write on the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nora, for, for sharing the, the experience of the both countries as well as the resources uh, at the very end. <laughs> um, I'm tempted to sneak in a question, but we are just on time, so I will pass it first on to our colleague from Umidu. Um, both you, Nora, and Ivan have mentioned the automotive sector, so that's actually one of the sectors that we're going to look more into depth in, in the context of uh, Colombia. So I, I would like to welcome to the floor now um, the two speakers, uh, Mr. Alan Bachenheimer and Mr. Nemenja da Hoya. Um, um, welcome to the floor. Hey, Silvia, thank you so much. Well, we are so happy to be here with all of you guys. My name is Alan Bachenheimer, and I'm here with my colleague, Cindy Mendieta. We are from Unido in Colombia. And what we are going to see today is an overview of what we uh, have done at UNIDO in Colombia to support the retention, attraction, and, and service of the investors in the COVID-19 crisis. And well, more, more specific, specifically in the automotive industry. Okay, next please. Okay, just a short overview of the project. And uh, we have been working the last uh, four and a half years in a project that is aimed to enhance quality and productivity of the automotive industry and its supply chain in Colombia. It, it is financed by the Korean government, the Korean International Cooperation Agency, COICA. And the budget uh, it was uh, 4.3 million US dollars. We have been focusing five um, different subjects. Uh, first one is policy advisory to the government. Second one is to support the national quality infrastructure to improve the quality in the country. The third one is the, the enhance of the productivity and quality of the enterprises in the country. And the fourth one uh, is to promote investments uh, uh, and the attraction and the export promotion. And the last part is to uh, work on new product developments and uh, improve the capacities of these new product de developments in the country. So next, please. Silvia. Okay, thanks. So, um, so when the COVID-19 appeared, we have a uh, okay, uh, big problem. We, we, we tried to identify those problems. I mean, the industry, the enterprises of the automotive industry. Uh, then we found uh, their main concerns on, on this crisis. We analyzed those problems. And then we made a list of prioritization and we prioritized their needs. Then we put a set of tools, we create a set of tools, uh, the whole project to help them. And then of course we are doing follow up of, of the results. Uh, what we're going to talk later in the next slides are the set of tools that we have uh, created and, and developed with the, 
with the enterprises, with the indirect prices. Next, please. So in Colombia, the COVID uh, have a great impact as well as, as many countries. Uh, specifically for us uh, and for the automotive industry, it was a big problem because the automotive industry was not prioritized by the government because the government were saying that we were, or the industry were uh, essential for, for, the, for the industry, for the country. So we have to prove that uh, we were uh, able to restart the companies again uh, in order to let us uh, restart all the, all, the, all the activities. So second one was the uh, commercial part. Uh, the demand dropped 28%. Uh, we sold 28% less cars and that of course uh, affected the whole value chain. And uh, we also have, have as, as everyone, uh, disruptions in the global supply chain. So we have some delays and problems on that. And of course, uh, the enterprises has, uh, had cash flow problems also. So we have also financial problems in, in the whole uh, industry, the, the whole companies, all the companies. Next, please. So we are what we are going to see are uh, in different levels uh, activities. We have done activities with the enterprises in the micro level. We have done um, activities with the institutions, with the local institution entities. And also we have done activities with the policymakers. So we, we will talk uh, on each uh, later in the next uh, slides. Also, we have uh, some immediate uh, activities, short-term activities, uh, medium-term activities, and long-term activities. We have the divided uh, the presentation on that. So we will start with the immediate activities. Um, please, next. So as soon as the COVID-19 arrives, um, we have uh, we start to work with, with the local institutions and the enterprises. And with the local institutions, what we did uh, is to create some guidelines to restart production, of course, in a safety way. Uh, we create two documents that they actually, those were mandatory by the government to restart the industry. So we, all the teams start to work on that and, and it was really quick. We had that in a few weeks so, and that uh, guaranteed the restart of the, of the production of, of the automotive industry. So, and in the immediate impact, uh, also, we work with the enterprises and we train 475 employees uh, and 276 managers with safety protocols in order to restart production. And also, and also we gave uh, some technical support to 43 enterprises. This is the course of, of the two documents that we created at uh, that time. Also, in the short term, we have work. Uh, uh, please, can you continue? Next, yeah. oh, sorry, those are the, yeah, there. So on the uh, short term, we also work with the enterprises. We support their diversification of B2B activities and also their financial planning. And we work with 70, 7, 27 enterprises uh, to do that. Next, please. Okay, See many you. thanks, Helen. And regarding to the medium term impact, we the project support Colombian enterprises to register as a supply on the 28 different international OEMs databases. Having as a result, Colombian enterprises have jointly complete 357 and registration. In parallel to documents where they will present and essential information that an enterprise is needing to understand and take into consideration when seeking equity and the uh, financial specifically one of these guys covered four different sources of finance including fdi commercial credit crowdfunding and financial pro uh, programs of, um, for development and the second one is done with the purpose of help enterprises attract foreign investors um, as a as an institutional program um, pro colombia the national Investment Attraction Agency promote the near-shoring strategy as one of the most important considering that the FDI 
will be a crucial factor in the economic reactivation and Colombia is taking advantage of the global commercial reconfiguration and the relocalization of multinational operation. In this way, it is focused on different sector and, promote, and promotion is working as a bridge between the potential automotive companies and pre-Columbia and with the aim of getting communication with them in the language that is the, the investor is expecting. And next, please. And this is the cover of the, the two guides. Next, please. Okay, in the long term, at the policy level, the project supported the government in 2018 in the elaboration of the new sector specific policy document known as the Pact and for the mobility industry. During the last six months, the pack was considered as a roadmap for the economic reactivation. And at the institutional level, the project has introduced a series of new services available to the automotive industry to improve enterprises and R&D capacities. But and last but not least, the project elaborated a report on the state of the financial health of the enterprises in the automotive value chain to help government and actors understand the risk of enterprises bankruptcy caused by additional financial distress. The report comprising the financial data of 171 enterprises for the auto industry between the 2016 to 2018, and being aware of the industrial reality that helps public institutions to shape their support programs in a more effective manner. And next, please. And this is the, the design and simulation network that was launched in the last name of April. We have eight different companies working on that. And next, please. Okay, as a conclusion, we realize that the industry has different challenges in the, in the business environment. New strategies to improve the resilience of the value chains have been analyzed as a near shoring suppliers diversification and better use of the FTIs. Enterprises need to be able to meet international market and customer requirements, identify new logistic solution, adapt marketing strategies as an e-commerce and e-marketing, get connected to new payments and smart contracting uh, platforms and meet global value change and standard and expectations. Also, we would like to highlight that the digitalization as a key condition to access a global value change. And parallel new, mobil new mobility trends and applied technology, electromobility, autonomous vehicles, shared services, and industry 4.0 and greening supply chain as a major priority for policymakers. Uh, many thanks for your attention and yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are exactly on time. Uh, a big thank you to the panelists. Uh, lots of information. Yes. Um, we're still a little shy on the Q&A, so I will, uh, I will shamelessly uh, just ask the first question and then pass the word to my colleague Ivan to moderate uh, the Q&A. Um, I'd be curious, and this is, the, this is the question for all of the panelists, um, there is this infamous saying that every crisis is an opportunity. Um, what do you think is the most important aspect of the business environment that governments should address at this point in time in the respective countries that you were mentioning to support the government, their countries in, in seizing this opportunity. Should we start with my colleague, Ivan? <laughs> Since nobody's responding. Yep, sure. Um... Yeah, what, what, is, what is the one most important thing? Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I, I mean, I think what I noticed from all of the panelists actually is a, is a very common theme about reevaluating the, 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 the FDI strategies that the governments had had in place up till now uh, and seeing what impact that, you know, that had been caused as a result of COVID. There was a lot of analyses going on about what the impact is and so forth. Uh, and I think in the in the early stages, everyone has done pretty much the same thing, which is trying to ensure that there's the ongoing viability of the firms. Uh, so that's been sort of 
tax related, finance related, direct, you know, incentives uh, to, to stay. Um, and in the long term, I think, you know, one thing it's going to be important to figure out like when to stop that assistance. And I think that question is, is, uh, is at the top of the minds of a lot of policymakers now, because there's an expectation that this will continue. Um, and then, so that's one, which is kind of like a negative thought, I suppose. And then the, the other one is, what are the, uh, how can government assist um, to improve the value proposition of, of firms? You know, how, how, because there's things that government can do. It's not all about, it's not all about the firm figuring out, um, you know, for itself uh, where it should go. It's governments can improve value proposition. So it's, uh, it's putting in place, for example, um, uh, in, 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 in improving the level of dialogue, international dialogue, you know, I know it's a longer term objective, but the, the, this, uh, the, the ability to sort of, uh, to, to invest, uh, instead of going towards a, um, a protectionist trend, try to see where you can be a little bit more open, right? So this, it's fine to have policy space to close, you know, because you're afraid that, uh, for example, sensitive sectors might be disrupted by, uh, because companies are in a weak state of affairs right now, and you might have sort of predatory buying coming from overseas. That's one thing. But I think it's important for governments to realize not to overstep the mark there in terms of the protectionist side. Uh, and unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of OECD countries who are doing just that, who are uh, putting in place these measures. So I think governments need to maintain this sense of balance about the support that they need to offer government, uh, com uh, the companies that are that are there, not just domestic, but also the foreign affiliates that are there in equal measure. There should be no discrimination between the two of them, um, because as we know, it's the foreign companies often that bring the sort of the higher value jobs and so forth. Um, and then to make sure that any measures that they put in place now um, are grandfathered out in due time and that they support through, you know, I guess the final thought is on incentives, right? So incentives have shifted around towards immediate crisis response, but incentives need to change uh, to the new emerged sectors that they're trying to attract FDI in. So it shouldn't just be a tax benefit for all. It should be focusing the limited amount of resources that governments now have because they all have less resources. Uh, so a long-winded answer and probably not just one thing, uh, but there's like a span of things that governments need to be thinking about right now. Thank you. Yeah, one direction. <laughs> um, some of the other panelists, please um, give us about your views. I might have a word. <laughs> I might not be able to answer you directly to your questions because I think a lot of things are very important currently. But um, I think this is an opportunity for uh, countries that are, um, you know, trying to attract new investment uh, because, uh, you know, company has been has not been able to visit uh, freely around the world and uh, looking for a good investment spot. Um, so and. Uh, and many com countries have been trying to, to improve their um, investment um, conditions and environment uh, during the you know, COVID pandemic. And how to, um, so it's very important, I think, um, to uh, present the changes uh, when the countries start to open, uh, I think during the course of 2021, um, how the country has changed uh, its, um, investment positions and, um, you know, conditions uh, so that the, you know, each of the countries who have tried to, to improve the environment will be able to attract and grasp the, the opportunities um, of new investments. I think that's it. <laughs> and Kristen, it, will be a, it will be a new landscape to see after, after the pandemic who, who took yeah. advantage of this time to really reform. Any of the other, of the other colleagues? No, very shy. Then I'll, I'll pass the word to, to Ivan to, uh, to raise some questions in his hand. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Yeah, I have a few, uh, a few questions to some of the 
uh, to each uh, to each of the, the colleagues uh, who presented. And thanks a lot for the excellent presentations. Uh, you know, I think um, we saw a lot of uh, a lot of common themes coming through, uh, particularly the presentations that were on the on the IPAs. Common theme of, uh, as, as Sylvia pointed out, the, the use of digital um, platforms, not just by firms, but actually by government, by the IPAs, and that's not surprising because IPAs, investment promotion agencies, are uh, you know should have a very strong private sector focus. So it would be um, it would be expected, I think, and they did deliver in that sense of sort of uh, changing the game from face to face to digital um, interactions between themselves and 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 um, investors within the country between themselves and investors seeking to come inside to the you know seeking to invest in the country and and also sort of um, uh, in terms of advocacy towards the government so my question um, maybe I can start with both uh, directing to both Ito and to Nora, Nora. Um, did you see um, any do you have any insights into uh, what new sectors or segments may have been arising as sectors of interest for your countries of operation, you know, for, for Bangladesh, for Moldova, for Tunisia, uh, because there's mention of nearshoring, reshoring and opportunities that are arising. Uh, have any become evident already at this stage? And I can point out, for example, in Bangladesh, one of the challenges to my mind is the lack of diversification and the fact that it's kind of trapped at this lower end of garment manufacturing and textiles and so forth and is really looking to burst out of that into another area or a higher value area is is there anything emerging in that sense uh, and similarly for moldova and tunisia on the on the auto or any of the other sectors and segments so maybe start with saki and then and then come to um the ito and then go to uh nora yeah thank you um, so as I uh, presented during my presentation, I, our team's analysis is still sort of ongoing. So um, I haven't got the all the um, outcomes. But I just said uh, in Bangladesh, RMG, uh, ready-made garments, uh, was already a very strong sector. Um, and it continues to be a, a sector to, to promote investment in, but uh, I think it was already an existing thing. Um, and also pharmaceutical uh, sector, it was strong uh, before COVID. Um, as an opportunity, um, what I was uh, looking at the, the, the results that came out, I think the um, automobile sector uh, could be very interesting. Um, there was a um, presentation for, during the presentation of, of um, other colleagues. I think there was a uh, mention that the the automobile um, aut well, uh, sector uh, had a difficulty during the COVID because of the uh, disrupted value chain. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, uh, during the COVID, I think people. Uh, you know, started to avoid public transportation that's too crowded, especially in Bangladesh, buses are really crowded. So, um, and people started to shift to, uh, you know, ride motorbikes and uh, automobiles, cars and stuff. So um, I think there's a, a, you know, growing demand. I don't know if that continues to be so after, you know, everyone's vaccinated, but um, this could be a, you know, a, an opportunity for Bangladesh to, to seize the, the demand. I think um, investors can seek for the demand in Bangladesh, in country as well as, you know, exporting outside, um, you know, manufacturing in Bangladesh and exporting as well. So um, I think that could be one, one sector to look at. Okay, and just a quick follow up on that. Uh, so I think in South, South Asia, uh, India in particular is looking to benefit from maybe some, uh, uh, from uh, uh, companies looking to divest out of China and invest, you know, in the near region, including uh, is in India. Uh, I know that India is definitely targeting that. Is Bangladesh also mm -hmm. targeting that possibility? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Nora. Same question to you on the possibility of um, new sectors and segments opening up as a consequence of the crisis. 
Yeah, uh, in Tunisia, we have seen that uh, some uh, new sub uh, sectors uh, have uh, known a good uh, rise after the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so we have the technical textile uh, as well as the plastic uh, industry. Uh, so uh, we have seen also that some sectors like the automotive and uh, the uh, aeronautics uh, sector uh, have readjusted their production uh, in order to produce uh, equipment uh, for uh, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in Moldova, the automotive sector has readjusted uh, its um, uh, production uh, in order to uh, switch from producing car covers uh, to producing uh, private, uh, per personal private um, no, sorry, personal uh, protective equipment. Um, and uh, for example, for GIZ, this was a direct sub, uh, direct assistance request from an investor uh, which needed uh, support in order to readjust its uh, production. Uh, the ICT sector also is uh, always uh, interesting and is uh, gaining uh, more and more importance uh, in the face of the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we, uh, as you have said, some uh, key sectors which were uh, initially very important and uh, the focus sectors of the country, such as the automotive and aeronautics, uh, are uh, unfortunately uh, uh, suffering and struggling. Thank you. I, I just had a couple of follow-ups on, 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 on what you said, which is... Um... Which was super interesting. So, so um, the first one was on um, uh, on the on the nearshoring or the or the opportunities that are arising, and you pointed out some in plastics and uh, and others, um, uh, and also obviously the the PPE. Uh, how much is the impact of the Europe the, the closeness, the proximity to the European Union market? Um, as a, a, a factor in the new opportunities, because you know when we talk about uh, nearshoring or it's nearshoring rather than reshoring, the expectation is that um, rather than having these very long supply chains that extend you know all over the place, that that, that for example, uh, car manufacturers from Germany would be looking to come closer. So maybe Moldova would be a close one, Tunisia True. not so close. It's still part of the near neighbourhood. Are you seeing anything like that? Uh, I think, yes, uh, in Moldova, uh, unfortunately, my colleague Thomas Fersh is not uh, among us uh, today. Uh, he is more able to, to give you insights uh, on that. Um, in Tunisia, there are efforts uh, from the government and from the IPA to uh, near shore and attract uh, uh, investors uh, in order to have these uh, reduced supply chains uh, but we don't uh, have concrete opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's very early. It, it, a lot of this stuff is being talked about in, in theory at this point because it's still quite early. But um, yeah, I think one of the things that we see from the surveys that I was talking about in my presentation is that there is a tendency towards this, but the tendency is not as big as it was first envisaged in terms of companies actually changing their su supply chains because there's so much so much much more stock is put into this efficiency aspect than into any other sort of uh, element of, of supply chains. Anyway, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have a question now for um, for Alan and Cindy. I have two questions actually. So the first one is you talked about in the beginning of the presentation uh, when Alan was speaking on the um, an advocacy role that uh, the project played or that was had to be done because uh, the particular sector that you're working in automotive uh, was not deemed a, you know, a priority sector for government support. Could you talk a little bit about that process and how you went about that and who was the government counterpart doing the advocacy? Which part of government did you have to advocate to and who was doing the advocacy? That's one part and then, then we, I can come to the other one. Uh, next question after that. Okay, well, I can, I can answer that one. 
Ivan. So here in Colombia, as I think many countries, uh, we found uh, we we saw the closure of many of the industries because of the pandemic. Of course, nobody has uh, some protocols, safety protocols to work, you know, next to each other. And we, of course, there was a, a possible uh, spread of, of the COVID in the factories. So the government shut down most of the of the companies. Uh, they just uh, maintain uh, the crucial factories and crucial services. I mean, uh, well, uh, let's say factories of, uh, of food and processing food and this type of stuff were still open, maybe reduced, but still open. But the automotive wasn't uh, prioritized because, of course, it wasn't like a first uh, element in the in the in the economy. So the government uh, asked for uh, prepare these companies that was not prioritized uh, to open uh, with uh, creating some protocols for them to, to reopen with safety measures. So actually the Ministry of Industry asked UNIDO and asked our team to, as, as the first uh, team or of the first uh, part to create a protocol, a safety protocol based on, of a, on different uh, protocols worldwide to reopen in a safety way the, the factories. So I think it took like a, almost two months. In, meanwhile, we create the protocol. We, let's say, uh, teach or train the companies with those protocols and they apply those protocols and they then they reopen the factories after after let's say two three months uh, so it was really thought because uh, uh, of course and challenging because uh, well we would have never done that before we have to run the whole team run doing that the government has to make some appro approvals and anyhow we we we, we found uh, uh, finally, after two months, the, the opening of, of factories. Anyhow, we found different problems because the factories were open, but they didn't have orders. So, I can I can link this with what we were you were talking before about the new possible diversification opportunities, and we found in the medical appliances and uh, uh, new opportunities. But, but that's a different question. Anyhow, it was like three months uh, work. For to reopen these uh, non prioritized prioritized sectors. Uh, your microphone. Exactly. Thanks. Um, maybe we can go to what you were alluding to, which is these kind of new opportunities that arose, if if and what what, what they were, and also when did the government sort of um, is the government of the view that you know the automotive uh, you know the work that you're doing in the automotive industry broadly. Is a is a um, you know a, a part of the recovery? Do they see it as a part of the recovery, or are they still in the sort of you know in that sort of earlier footing? No, actually, well, it is. You know, as you may saw worldwide, most of the automotive industry use turning to the medical devices. I, I know in the U.S., Ford and different brands start to create uh, ventilators for for the industry, and also uh, we we did the same here in a smaller level uh, and of course we were working with these stretchers and different medical appliances for the industry some of the companies just created a new lines production production lines and new market um, uh, product lines for them and they are still selling those type of uh, products after you know the big crisis uh, so these opportunities uh, were were interesting for some companies to just diversificate. Uh, also, we found that the motorcycle industry started to boom because of the deliveries. Of course, everybody was locked down at home, so the deliveries start to you know boom in, in the whole country. So the the sales of the motorcycles start to of course arise, and people start to buy motorcycles. So so the automotive industry uh, and the motorcycle par were in a small boom so that was that was good also for for an industry and most of the tier one suppliers start to focus on the motorcycle instead of the automotive that was uh, slower you know the 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 growth so there was some different interesting factors that uh, the COVID created that most of the companies were uh, taking advantage of Okay, and then just one last question, maybe for yourself or for Cindy. I'm not sure, but uh, it, it, and it's um, 
I, I saw that um, in your in, in the UNIDA program there you had a sort of a certain amount of um, like matchmaking or working with the domestic firms as well and helping to cause this link between domestic and incoming foreign investors or existing foreign investors. Did you change, did that change in any way as a result of the crisis? Did you do more or less of that or change that part of the work in any way? Well, actually we, we increased these, um, these activities. We have done since uh, before the, the COVID the B2B match, matchmaking activities, local B2B matchmaking activities and international B2B matchmaking activities and the local ones uh, were really increased and we found new opportunities during that time of course uh, everybody has to be at home you know in the computer so it, it became easier actually for us to put together people you know through screens so so we, we also found uh, easier to make matchmaking because in the usual way you know you make a, a event and there's a b2e event with people traveling from all over the country to a specific city so right now it increased the amount because of the easiness of the of the you know zoom and all those platforms yeah. but yeah yeah they, and, and of course it was an increase of, of much local matchmaking between companies that's great i mean that's also a, I guess a positive byproduct yep. of a negative situation but that's fantastic right. actually that and it makes a lot of sense that you would turn to looking more closely at the domestic uh, the domestic side and matching them up uh because of the fdi is is, is reduced so that's um yeah makes a lot of sense excellent great um sylvia Thanks. i notice it's 9 25. thank you thank you very much alan um i'm gonna pass back to you i think it's time for the summarization and the conclusion great uh thank you so much um a big thank you to all of the panelists uh first of all it's been a really exciting uh session I would maybe leave the session with five main uh, key takeaways. I'm sure there are many more, and we will share in the recording and the presentations um, after this. Uh, but first of all, is the importance of having really timely information and timely data on firm behavior and government behavior at the same time, at the global level as well as at the, at the country yeah, level, as we've seen of some of the monitoring efforts. <laughs> Uh, for example, in Bangladesh and other the, the countries that we heard from. Uh, and to be really uh, in, for governments to be in, in constant dialogue with the private sector, uh, to see how are they adapting, how they're adjusting. Um, digitalization uh, is a third uh, very big, uh, big uh, theme that many uh, spoke to, uh, a trend that impacts uh, pretty much every aspect, uh, infrastructure on, at the country level, uh, firm behavior and the way that they're organizing supply chain and the way that people are working from home, uh, government, uh, con uh, business to consumer uh, interactions, online payments, online selling, uh, a very key trend, as well as, of course, support to uh, digitization of government agencies so they can provide services in the context of COVID. And as we just learned, there's also a huge opportunity to use these digital platforms to make the world smaller and to connect uh, people and companies at a much lower cost. But there are some opposing trends and we'll have to see um, in which uh, how, how the, the landscape develops. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we learned that overall, uh, there wasn't the, as much of a disruption to supply chains as we may have expected. Uh, but on the other hand, we do, we've learned that in some countries that, that is part of the strategy for recovery, uh, nearshoring and to look more at the domestic market. Um, we've also seen that while some of the governments are really clearly investing in simplifying um, particularly uh, particular regulations that allow then companies to adjust better or uh, to support specific sectors, Others are increasing also the investment barriers. Um, so, and interestingly enough, the majority are in the OECD uh, space. So, very interesting uh, trends to, to observe going forward. And last but not least, uh, some of opportunities uh, for, the, for, for new trends which have been accelerated really by the crisis. And I mentioned already digitalization, but there's also a big opportunity to invest in the green economy um, at this point and really. To think about more sustainable ways uh, and it's, it's very encouraging to hear that many multinational companies are directly investing in that space and, and looking at that. Uh, so with that I would like to uh, thank 
very much. I have one last question. Um, maybe we can, um, and we have two minutes. So I will put Ivan on the spot. Uh, there's a question. Is there any study on the expected sectors with the quickest recovery and the slowest recovery from COVID? I think it's a very, very nice way to conclude. So Ivan. Um, there's lots of studies that are being done at the moment. Um, in, in the slide deck that I presented, there is a, a second or third slide where I introduced the, um, the survey. Uh, at the bottom, there are two links. Uh, one is to um, you know, and uh, one is to the survey, and another is to uh, the thing that we call the FDI uh, quarterly. Anyway, we follow those links. That's some information there where we're following, asking basically multinationals what's what's going on and which sectors are being most affected. Um, so from the bank, there's there's these resources. Uh, that information that I provided in response to Sylvia's question to me about the sectors and so forth also came from these studies that we, we've been doing all along. So that I can only speak for, for bank, but I know that, for example, I'm pretty sure that uh, UNIDO is doing the same. I know that UNCTAD has done, if you go to the UNCTAD site, uh, you'll find also information about the COVID disruption and also which sectors and segments are the most most disrupted. I think the key thing is, um, you know, there are global trends, but there are also country level, um, uh, you know, impacting at country level. So you need to really look at country by country to understand what is the most disrupted or least disrupted um, sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ivan. Um, very, I think that's a very good observation there are global trends, but in the end, it is really very country specific uh, in terms of how do we respond to this, uh, to this crisis. So without further ado, I would like to conclude this webinar. A big thank you uh, to Ivan, to Saki, uh, to Nora, to Alan, and to Cindy. And also a very big thank you to Jim and Ella uh, from the Journal Committee for Enterprise Development for the superb organization and support with the webinar. And thank you to everybody who attended and for your, uh, for your attention. We'll be sharing the recording and the presentation. Thank you very much and have a great day, afternoon, and evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you so Thank much. You.